Hi. Uh, thank you for coming out here. Uh, it's it's going to make a lot of difference. Uh, we are honored here to have a guest here from Boston tonight. Uh, in 2008, he disrupted an oil and gas auction. And because of his actions, the land that was up for sale was not given to oil companies. For his action, he spent 18 months in federal prison, but now he is the co-director of a group he helped found called the Climate Disobedience Center, which is out here helping the Delta Five through their historic trial. So please welcome Tim DeChristopher. Thank you. Thank you all for, for being out here tonight and for showing up to support the, the Delta Five. Um, especially want to thank all, all the organizers who helped make this happen, um, all the Food Not Bombs people um, who, who supplied the food. We really appreciate that. Um, and, it's, and it's really been a blessing for me to, to be out here this week and to be able to be a part of this, this trial and this organizing effort um, in this larger community. Um, I'm, I'm told that it's, that it's beautiful out here. I haven't, I've, um, I've, I've been in Seattle for a few days and I haven't seen anything in the daylight yet. Um, I, all my time outside has been at night because um, I've been in a trial all day long. Um, but, but it's still been incredibly rewarding to see that. Um, as was mentioned, um, I went through my own civil disobedience case several years ago. Um, an action that started in 2008 and a trial that happened in 2011. And, and it, was, it was my intention from the get-go to, to, to try to use the necessity defense. At that time, I, was, I had been inspired by the Kings North Six activists in, in the UK who were acquitted with this defense in, in the fall of 2008. I read that a couple months before I disrupted the, the, um, the BLM oil and gas auction. So, so this has been something that's been in my mind for a long time and, and was definitely not able to make it happen in my case. I, I had a judge who shut everything down and, and I was allowed to say almost nothing in my own trial. So um, I've been trying to make that happen in, in other ways and, and supporting other activists who have been engaging in civil disobedience. And as was mentioned, I, I helped found the, the Climate Disobedience Center with the, the three folks who organized the lobster boat blockade action that, that you might have heard about in Massachusetts a few years ago where they anchored a lobster boat in front of the Brayton Point coal-fired power plant and, and prevented a shipment, a shipment of West Virginia coal from being delivered to that power plant. And they were prosecuted and they actually got permission to use the necessity defense. But then on the first day of their trial, the, the district attorney, before things started, the district attorney came in and took over the prosecution and dropped all the criminal charges. And then came outside to all the folks that we had gathered, all the media and clergy and supporters that we had gathered outside, and gave this speech about how he was dropping all the charges out of concern for all the children who would be impacted by climate change. And he said, he said there's been a serious failure of political leadership on this issue that necessitates this kind of action. And it, it was a few weeks before the big march in New York a couple years ago, and he held up Bill McKibben's Rolling Stone article, and he was like, I'm going to be in New York in a couple weeks marching. Um, and, uh, and I was just completely dumbstruck and, and in awe of all of this, um, you know, as a... Um, as a, as a fairly spiritual person, I, I don't believe that there's any group of people that are, that are inherently bad people. But there are certain groups that I have to remind myself that I believe that. Um, and, and towards the top of that list is probably criminal prosecutors in the age of mass incarceration. And, and certainly after spending a couple years in prison, it, it just, just reinforced and, and further radicalized that belief. So, so to have a criminal prosecutor, a district attorney, come out and, and join us just, just really blew me away and, um, and, and was shocking to me and made me really question a lot of, a lot of how I was approaching things. 
you know, not only was it somebody who I never expected to be on our side, but it was literally his job to not be on our side. And, and he broke out of that role into which he was assigned and, and stepped into an entirely new role. And, and so I thought a lot about why that happened. You know, because one of the things about that lobster boat blockade, when, when Jay and Ken and Marla organized that, a lot of the local organizers who were, the, even the environmental groups who were fighting that specific power plant, they said, don't do this action. They said it's too radical. They said it'll it'll alienate people. Um, you know, it'll it'll be too confrontational. So this was this was considered like an extremely bold action, and and they did it in a very uncompromising kind of way. They were driven by principle, and they said this is what must be done, and, and we're not going to back down from that. And and so they went and did it. So they did this uncompromising action, and yet they did it in a way that they invited their their supposed opponent to step out of that role and be their, their ally. So it was both very confrontational and very inviting at the same time. And, and so I sat down with those folks and I said, how can we do, do that kind of action more and more? How can we bring that kind of principle and that kind of spirit into the work of the climate movement? Because we know that there are more and more people in this movement that are at the point of what, ready to take bold actions. People that have, have gotten to that point of being so fed up with, with working within the system. We've got more people that are ready to take direct action. How can we make the most of it and, and do it in a way that realizes that, that full potential of, of civil disobedience? And, and so that's, that's the work that we've been trying to do. And so when we saw the Delta Five case, we said, uh, this, this is a great opportunity. We've got to be involved in this. We've got to help these folks out. And, and so you know, we were working with them for, for the last few months, and, and at each step of the way, we said, yes, this, this trial has potential. It has, it has potential to, to be historic. And, um, and I don't use that word lightly, that this is, this is something that, that really shapes our, our future and, and ha can have a big impact. And, and it might seem um, idealistic to be saying that about our current actions, that our current actions, what we're doing right now, is historic. Um, but, I, but I think that's, that's always been the case for, for so many of the regular people who have engaged in civil disobedience throughout our history and have had a historic impact. Um, on my way out here, I, I happened to, to be reading the, the trial of the Catonsville Nine by Daniel Berrigan. Um, which was all drawn from their court transcripts, from their civil disobedience action in, in 1968 when they broke into the, the draft records office in Catonsville, Maryland, and forcibly took out all, all the draft records that they could carry, carried them into the parking lot, and, and lit them on fire with homemade napalm. Um, and, and so they were, they were prosecuted for that and, and, and ultimately convicted but, but in their trial, um, they, they really tried to make things, um, they seemed to have an understanding that, that this was historic. They seemed to have an understanding of, of the importance of what they were doing in that moment. And, and I just want to share a little bit from what Philip Berrigan, who was a Catholic priest, uh, said when he was on the stand. This is like as he's being examined on the stand. He said, we have already made it clear our descent runs counter to more than the war, which is but one instance of American power in the world. Latin America is another. So is the Near East. This trial is yet another. From those in power, we have met little understanding, much silence, much scorn and punishment. We have been accused of arrogance, but what of the fantastic arrogance of our leaders? What of their crimes against the people, the poor and powerless? Still, no court will try them. No jail will receive them. They live in righteousness. They die in honor. For them, we have one message. For those in whose manicured hands the power of the land lies, we say to them, lead us. Lead us in justice, and there will be no need to break the law. 
Let the president do what his predecessors failed to do. Let him obey the rich less and the people more. Let him think less of the privileged and more of the poor. Less of America and more of the world. Let lawmakers, judges, and lawyers think less of the law, more of justice. Less of legal ritual, more of human rights. To our bishops and superiors, we say, learn something about the gospel and something about illegitimate power. When you do, you will liquidate your investments, take a house in the slums, or even join us in jail. To lawyers, we say, defend draft resistors, ask no fees, insist on justice, risk contempt of court, go to jail with your clients. To the prosecution, we say, refuse to indict opponents of war, prefer to resign, practice in private, to federal judges, we say give anti-war people suspended sentences to work for justice and peace or resign your posts. You men of power, I also have a dream. Federal judges, district attorneys, marshals against the war in Vietnam. You men of power, you have told us that your system is reformable. Reform it then and we will help with all our conviction and energy in jail or out. <laughs> And I read that on my way out to this, to this trial this, at the beginning of this week. And, and after all of my experience in courtrooms and in my own trial, I thought, God, I can't even imagine that kind of thing being said on the stand in a courtroom. And after talking to, to so many people who have been through that process where all that's allowed to be talked about is legal technicalities. Um, and that's the only thing that's allowed inside the courtroom. I just couldn't even imagine a time when this was what was allowed to be talked about on the stand. And, and then today, when I watched the Delta Five defendants take the stand in their own trial to argue the necessity defense, and they were talking not just about climate change, but also about the way that the fossil fuel industry corrupts our political process. They were talking about how our whole system is broken how the only answer to money in politics is people power. They were talking about the history of civil disobedience and why all of their efforts for decades working within the system, running for office, doing all these various things that they've all done, why none of that is enough because that whole system is broken, why we need more, why people need to be inspired, why people need to be connected and, and make their voices heard even when their voices are, are locked out of positions of power. I thought, this is what, what I've been waiting for. I, I, I still couldn't believe that that could actually happen in an American courtroom in this day and age. And, and we saw it today. And, and I, I actually got choked up at one point um, watching Patrick, the first defendant, on the stand because I, I said, this is what I've been waiting and working for for the last seven years of my life, to see this kind of climate trial happen. And now it's happening, and they're winning. They're winning at every stage of this. The, the judge rules in their favor on every single point. Every objection from the prosecution gets shot down. Um, every every Thing that they want to say in that courtroom, they're getting the chance to say. It's, it's amazing. Um, I, I didn't think it was possible. Uh, and it, it's Washington State. It's, it's also a judge who's around my age. Um, I think that might have something to do with it, that it's a, it's a judge who's still going to be here in 2050. Um, who, who knows that he's going to be around as things get uglier and uglier. And, and I think that's, that's one of the interesting things about organizing in this time and organizing on this issue around climate change is that, that it's so pervasive that, that you never know who is staying up at night having this existential crisis 
about, about climate change? Who's staying up at night wondering what kind of world they're going to be living in in a few decades, what kind of world their children or grandchildren are going to be living in? And, and what that means for activists is that that whole structure of empire has cracks all through it, that, that there are weaknesses in this whole power structure that we're fighting against on so many issues, that, that all of the people who are holding that together hold the potential to be on our side when we push them, which was the other lesson that I learned from Ken and Jay and Marla in their lobster boat case, was that this district attorney, he might have been staying awake at night thinking about climate change, but he'd never done anything, he'd never spoken up at all, until they forced him into that position through their uncompromising action. And then they changed the dynamic of that whole situation. And, and that's why I think it's, it's such an exciting time to be an activist, especially in this movement, is that, that we can attack that entire power structure that is holding this empire together. And, and certainly a lot of times when we do, we're, we're gonna run into a solid wall and we're gonna get pushed back. But throughout that structure, there are cracks. And when some of us working in a lot of different ways, pushing on all different points of that power structure, find that, that weak spot, we can all get behind them and push and, and open up that crack so that, so that a whole movement can, can get through that wall. And that's what's happening right now, this week, with this trial. That, that there were five activists who stopped that, who, who were on that tripod in front of that train. And now there's this whole community that is supporting them throughout their trial, bringing attention to this, making this a much, much bigger story. By our presence, by our support here for them, we are making this historic. This is a historic moment because we are making it so with our collective presence. We are making it important. Ahmad just told me that, that he heard from a reporter from The Guardian who's getting on a plane tonight, flying from the UK to be here at the trial tomorrow. Because people are realizing the importance of this case. And it's our support. It's the support of all of us who are showing up. Showing up not just for the actions and the hearings and things like that, but showing up for each other. Showing up to hold one another. Showing up to support each other. We are actually making each other more powerful as we do that. That's, that's the value of, of what we do collectively. So I thank you all for doing that. And, and I hope you do that not just with your presence here tonight, but with your financial support as well. That this opportunity is literally getting bigger right now as we speak. That each day that this trial goes on, this opportunity is getting bigger and bigger. And, and that means that this organizing community here needs the resources to take full advantage of that. And, and you've got the envelopes there on your table to make those contributions right now. So far, they've, they've collected $1,500 from this event, and, and they need $3,000 to, to help meet their goal for tonight and ultimately they need $5,000 to, to be prepared for the fees that, that the Delta Five can receive if they're convicted at the end of this week. So we wanna make it clear to the activists who are under a lot of stress during this trial right now that we've got their back. We wanna, we wanna take any stress off of them that we can as they continue their testimonies into tomorrow and, and are up there on the stand. We want to make it clear that, that we've got their back with whatever consequences they face. But I also want to say, we might just win this. I know it, I know it, it feels crazy actually to say it, but um, 
they might actually win this trial. And in that case, they're going to need those resources even more. Because there's going to be activists lining up to take direct action in civil disobedience when the Delta Five get acquitted this week. And, and, and this organizing community needs to be prepared to take advantage of all of the energy that comes out of this trial and focus it on all the battles against the fossil fuel industry that, that are happening right here in this state. It needs to, it needs to be absolutely clear that, that this case, this action, is just a harbinger of what's to come if the fossil fuel industry keeps moving forward with building new fossil fuel infrastructure in this part of the country. It needs to be absolutely clear that there's going to be a lot more civil disobedience and a lot more people supporting each other in civil disobedience. And, and that's what your support here tonight can do, can show, can help this organizing community be ready to take advantage of, of this historic moment. So I thank you all for being here tonight. I thank you for your generosity for, for supporting the Delta Five and the Seattle Rising Tide community that, that has had their back since day one in this action. Um, thank you for being a part of this. Yeah, so I think we've got some extra time here if we want to do a Q&A kind of thing. If, if folks have questions about what's been going on in the trial this week or, or any other kind of questions, I think we're ready to, to take those. Anybody? What's that? Also, so if you want to make an online donation, take it out to the hospital or with a credit card. Yes. Anybody have questions about the trial or any other kind of work? Yeah. Um, so the question was about what what happened with this drastic change in in the judge from from the first decision to ban the necessity defense and then turning around two days later and allowing the necessity defense um, and and a lot of us have been asking us or asking ourselves that that question ever since it happened and and it was certainly a surprise you know the the only thing that I can figure is that, that the judge's order initially banning the necessity defense looked extremely standard to me and you know, was based on a lot of the legal precedent cases that I've seen referenced before in, in these kind of cases. So it kind of seemed like he was just going through the motions. Um, and then I would say he woke up. And, and started thinking um, in, in those next couple days. Um, you know, it, it really was an awakening. And, um, you know, I, it definitely feels to me like um, one of those soft spots that opened up in these structures of power, that, that a judge stepped out of his normal role of just working on legal technicalities and only and only thinking in that kind of context and and started thinking as a person and and that's kind of what I've seen from from the judge this week which has frankly been shocking for me having seen judges before so 
I definitely think it's um, it's an awakening on some level that that this I would say that this judge is engaged right now on more than an intellectual level and and that's what's powerful here and and what's such a big opportunity So in a technical sense, it doesn't set precedent. Courts can only set precedent for the courts that are below them. And this is like the, the, low, the lowest level of, of a county court. So you know, appeals courts can set the precedent for the, for the courts that are below them. And that, that's like precedent in a binding way. Um, so this doesn't set binding precedent for anybody. Um, I think it, it does set an example kind of precedent, though. So it creates the kind of precedent that, that activists taking their cases to, to court, trying to use the necessity defense in other places, can point to this case and say, this judge allowed the necessity defense on these grounds. And so th they're more pointing to his argument rather than like the, the legal power of his ruling. But they're pointing to his argument and saying, basically, it's valid for a judge to do this. It, so this opens the space. It, it doesn't require any other judges to allow necessity, but it, but it opens the potential for it. So it's more of an expansion of, of potential than, than precedent, really. Yeah. From, from what I heard, you know, it, it, wasn't, it wasn't a written ruling. So we haven't been able to kind of look at exactly what his reasoning was. And, and from the folks who were in court at the time, what, what I've heard is that he, he said he had to go into his chambers for 20 minutes and reflect on this. Um, and, and he came out and said something about how judges rarely act with humility. And he's been talking to people recently about how judges probably need some more humility. And, and so it dawned on him that, that he needed to approach this case with some humility to be open to, to the arguments that are presented rather than immediately ruling that those arguments are invalid and shouldn't be allowed to be made. So the, the closest thing to an explanation that he gave was just saying he's, that he's doing it out of humility which again is a shocking thing for a judge to say. Um, well, the first part of that, in terms of specific examples, there's, at least in the climate movement, there's been a little movement in that direction over the past few years. There's been attempts, I would say, at, at trying to work with indigenous communities. Um, but I would say that the climate movement is still in, in the very early stages of of building those those relationships with not only with indigenous communities but with a lot of other social justice movements and marginalized communities um, you know and and part of that is that the environmental movement spent decades trying to appease those at the top of the current power structure and and trying to make our movement seem non-threatening and promoting this idea that we can just have a cleaner, greener version of the world that we have now, that we can just switch out our energy sources and keep everything else about society the same, because that, that would appeal to 
the people who profit from the status quo. Um, and, and that, you know, first off, that, that strategy failed horribly, um, you know, and, and really catastrophically blew up in 2009 um, with the failure of climate legislation and the failure of Copenhagen. Um, and, and a ton of resources went into that strategy. You know, the, a, a bunch of environmental foundations um, all coordinated together. And from 2007 to 2009, they had this plan called Design to Win that it was this work within the structure kind of plan, work with corporations and not get against them, appease that current power structure. It, you know, it was, the, it was the plan that created like the US Climate Action Partnership that was a coalition between a lot of our big green groups like World Wildlife Fund and, and the Sierra Clubs with a lot of our big multinational polluters like Shell and DuPont and BP. They were all working together on climate supposedly. The, those groups, those foundations, put $700 million between 2007 to 2009 in the Design to Win plan. Um, and it failed horribly. It didn't, it didn't get the job done at all. They had, they had nothing to show for it after 2009. But the other impact of that was that we alienated a lot of our natural allies. That when we pursued that strategy of saying, we can just change our energy system and keep everything else about society the same. All the people who didn't profit from the status quo didn't really want to be a part of our movement then. And they didn't really want to work with us because we were trying so hard to partner with the same people and the same structures that were oppressing them. So that was, I think, a lot of space opened up to, to have a more radical vision of social change in the climate movement and a vision of climate justice. A lot of space opened up after 2009 when, when that mainstream strategy failed so badly. But that's still pretty recent, you know, like that was just a few years ago after, after decades of the environmental movement having, having that kind of oppressive strategy, um, after the environmental movement having some serious baggage of outright xenophobia and, and fairly blatant racism in the, in the history of this movement. Um, and, and certainly after like, you know, the centuries of, of white supremacy and, and all the other baggage that, that we bring into this. Um, so, so it takes more than a few years to overcome that kind of baggage and build real trust, um, you know. And I think, I think there's there's an inc a growing amount of our movement that I think is trying to build those relationships in good faith, um, and experimenting, and and reaching out, and making mistakes along the way, and and certainly those mistakes are being made. People are getting offended. People are getting hurt in that, um, and. And yet people keep trying to reach out and build those relationships. So I think we're moving there. Um, I think we still have a whole lot of work that needs to be done on that front. Yeah, in the back. Um, you mean what was it that 
that inspired me to be willing to go to prison for two years? Is that basically the question? Um, this is kind of related to a conversation I was having at the table over here as we were eating that um, that I feel like one of the the things the thing that drives me forward in that is um, is the interplay of grief and gratitude that um, you know maybe the one of the best ways that I could explain this is um, a, another Catholic priest named John Deere that um, I've worked with a little a little bit. Um, he told me that a few years ago he he met Desmond Tutu, and and John Deere's been doing peace and justice work for a long time and civil disobedience and um, and so they kind of knew of each other or Tutu knew of him a little bit, but they never met. Um, and and as soon as they met, Tutu said, "John, you know you're going to have to keep doing this work for the rest of your life." This challenge is never going to go away. You're going to have to keep doing this work for the rest of your life. And, and John said, how, how do you do that? How have you been able to do this for so many years to keep, to keep pushing in this path? And Tutu said, I cry every day when I think about the grief and injustice and suffering in the world. And every day I laugh when I see the beauty and the spirit in the world and the people that are struggling for justice. And, and that to me, like that, that kind of tension between being, being fully open-eyed towards how bad things actually are and, and being willing to, to fully open oneself up or open oneself up to, to feel that, that suffering of the world, to be vulnerable to that. Um, and yet, to be just as open-eyed with so much of the goodness that is still in the world. And, and so, much of the, so many of the things and the people and the places that we love and that are worth fighting for. To have, to have like a, a willingness to, to fully embrace both of those at the same time and hold them in tension together. To me, I feel like that tension is, is what provides that constant energy and that, and that forward momentum that keeps driving us together. Like that, that tension, to me, is like, like a power system. Um, and, and that's why I think it's important you know, to be honest about how late in the game we are with climate change you know, and, and, and how much actual suffering and hardship we've already committed to. Um, and to be willing to go down that path of grieving for what is already lost and what is being lost and what will be lost, um, but to not do it in a way that we lose connection with all that is left to fight for. That, that holding the, both of those together, I think, is, is the only way to do this kind of work in, in a healthy way that sustains our soul and, and keeps building our power rather than draining us. And, and with that, I'm being told that, that, we're, that I'm out of time here, so I think um, the band might come up and play some more music, right? Am I wrong on that? Maybe not. <laughs> nope. No more music. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got time to, to hang out. Um, and, and again, thank you all for being here. Um, and remember to make those donations. Remember to check out the photos if you haven't. And, um, and see Ahmed about um, buying one of those photos. So thank you all for being here and for your generosity. Yeah.